On today's episode of Locked On Canucks, we take a look at day one of prospect camp, how the Canucks prospects felt being on the same ice as Henrik and Daniel Sudin, what impact that will have on them. Of course, free agency is right around the corner. There are frenzy rumors all across the land. And could Evgeny Malkin potentially be on his way to Vancouver? And also, what happened between the Islanders and the Canucks with JT Miller? It is Locked on Canucks on a Monday, and it starts now. Your Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Locked On Canucks on a special Monday edition of Locked On Canucks, July the 11th. Today's episode is brought to you by BetOnline.net. BetOnline has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet online where the game starts. And today's episode, we will start off with the NH, the Canucks prospect camp opening up and just some overall feelings from, you know, players, management, coaches on the prospect camp opening. We will dive into free agency, which begins on Wednesday at 9 a.m. Genny Malkin, a Hall of Famer, a you know, Pittsburgh Penguin legend, uh, was announced will be uh, testing the free agency waters. So Valerie Nichushkin re-upped with the Colorado Avalanche. The Leafs got Matt Murray. Evander Kane is going to market. Jack Campbell looks like he's going to market. So we'll touch all on that free agent detail soon. And then we'll also talk about what's going on between the Islanders and JT Miller uh, and what happened at the draft. But first, as I did mention, we will talk about the Canucks prospect camp, which got underway today. And a lot of these prospects have a lot to prove. You know, this is what you know they're brought in to do. Uh, they're brought in to, you know, ch- change the, you know, the complexion of this roster and this team. And all accounts by day one, um, there was a lot of interesting things. You know, Henrik and Daniel Sedin were on the ice for development camp on Monday, which, uh, to quote Arshdeep Baines, the Canucks uh, prospect from Surrey, B.C., uh, who led the WHL in scoring last year. Um, he said, that's something I can't even put into words. Um, they were my idols. Having And having them on the ice, tell them what to do. I will say any, I will listen to anything they want me to do. Um, then, of course, we had you know, Elias Patterson, not EP40, the Elias Patterson, the defenseman who was drafted 80th overall, uh, saying, I watched them as a kid. They've always been stars in, out in the world. And now being here with them and having them as a coach, it's something awesome. Jonathan Lecker Mackey, the first round pick said it's nice. It's nice to have Swedes around and they speak Swedish as well. Um, Abbott's were Canucks general manager and Canucks assistant general manager uh, was saying just how nice it was to have a prospects camp, having um, all the prospects here in Vancouver, uh, seeing the whites of their eyes. You get to know them and make it, you know, you get to have an easier evaluation process. You can see them battle. Um, so, My biggest takeaway from all of this is, first of all, A, it's great that all the prospects after, you know, a couple years of COVID, they're able to come back into Vancouver, uh, get acclimated with the city if they haven't been around, get to understand it, um, get to meet all the Canucks, you know, coaching staff, front office staff, uh, understand what the Canucks messaging is going to be, what their, um, what their plans are, what the systems are now even though a lot of these players will not sniff the big club at all this year. And I think it's safe to say the majority of them will not, or maybe all of them won't. It's important though, to get these players in, understand what it means to be a Vancouver Canuck, understand the system and the culture, this new management team and this new you know, organizational shift wants to have, because like it or not, a lot of these players will be uh, the future of this team. And, I know a lot of us, we get stuck in the, you know, tunnel vision of this is the next season is the biggest season that matters. But also, I think that all what also gets lost is that we also have to, you know, these prospect camps are integral uh, in allowing these players to know what it's like to be a Canuck, how do the system, um, the systems are setting the culture, the foundation. And I think that's always important. But also important about that learning prospect is Henrik and Daniel Sedin. You know, you I, 
read quotes of players saying how crazy and how you know amazing it was having them on yes that right there is the instant respect factor that you get when you have guys like Henrik and Daniel Sabin, franchise icons, hockey hall of famers, the list goes on, that are there on a will be here on a daily basis working with these young players, whether it's in Abbotsford or Vancouver, because they command respect, they deserve the respect, and players will listen to them. Yes, they might be a bit starstruck in day one, but you know, learning and having tutelage under these guys is massive. It's massively important. If you, whatever field you worked in, if, you know, one of the best to ever do something in your field was there on a daily basis to help teach you or to, you know, you know, give you advice or help you like that. You, most people would soak it up like a sponge. They would ask questions. That's what made, you know, a guy like Kobe Bryant so great was he openly talked about how he would ask Michael Jordan, his idol, you know, how did you do this? How did you do this? And not saying that these prospects are at that level just yet, but having the ability to be um, right next to Henrik and Daniel Steen, ask them questions like, oh, hey, how, did, how would you see this on a cycle? How would you, you know, do this on a specific play? Just having that, um, that resource available to you is massively, massively important. Um, and I think it's a huge key and why I love what this management team is doing in building um, this organization and building this team up, that having the smart people around. Um, just a couple, of, uh, uh, um, just a couple other notifications or observations, excuse me, uh, that were uh, listed and talked about uh, throughout the day one of prospect camps. Uh, the goalies, there was Aku Koskinovu, the Canucks prospect, goalie, and Ty Young, who was just drafted. They got some work with Ian Clark. Um, you know. Again, Ty Young got a lot of heat for his draft pick. His numbers weren't great, uh, but he's very raw. And Ian Clark loves his raw prospects, kind of like a blank canvas to, you know, mold them and kind of really fine-tune their game and, you know, see that development happen. So that's what we saw in defense uh, in the net. Uh, out on defense, of course, most eyes were on uh, Elias Pettersson, um, who, you know, look, they did show, there's, I saw some videos of them doing some battle drills. Um, and and, you know, it looked like it was a high compete. Um, and it was good to see. Now, we'll see. Um, and we saw what John looked like uh, out on the... Uh, he's small. That's what the video is. Small. Um, but he had the shot. We saw those undeniable wrist shot. We saw where, um, you know... Linus Carlson, you know, digging the corners. We saw, you know, players battling, competing. Um, and that was important. And that was, you know, exciting to see for Canucks fans, to see prospects, um, you know, just to be able to compete and, you know, seeing video footage of them potentially for the first time ever. I know for me, you know, seeing these prospects in Canucks colors and not on grainy international footage uh, was nice. So prospect camp continues. It's great to have. Um, all the prospects here in Vancouver building and, you know, getting to meet one another, understand the organization. So that right there is very, very important. And I think as this week progresses, we're going to see more and more from these prospects. And of course, on Lockdown Canucks this week, we will uh, have daily recaps of any newsworthy, noteworthy stuff from uh, Canucks prospect camp. But coming up after the break, we're going to dive uh, into free agency and more importantly, one certain Russian player. Um, who can potentially really, really help the Canucks um, moving forward. But first, I want to talk to you guys about the fine folks, my fine folks, our fine folks, our friends at BetOnline.net. It is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's NHL playoffs and Major League Baseball. BetOnline is your continued source for all your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And betonline.net remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. Betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in all of your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Betonline, where the game starts. Also, we have a special favor to ask you, an important favor to ask you. We've put together a survey so we can learn more about listeners like you and make your favorite Locked On podcast even better. 
This is your opportunity to tell us what you like and don't like about Locked On Podcast. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now to get started. It won't take very long, and everyone that completes the survey can now qualify for a chance to win one of ten hundred dollar gift card, Ticketmaster gift cards. Excuse me. Take your our audience survey. Go to LockedOnPodcast.com/survey. Thank you for your help. So we are back. Locked On Canucks show that keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. I'm of course your host Justin Pooney. So of course, as I mentioned, NHL free agency. Um, starts this on Wednesday. Um, and the Canucks were, you know, doing some final touches to their, you know, free agency plans. Uh, they extend qualifying offers to goalie Mikey DiPietro. Uh, they did not extend qualifying offers to uh, fan favorite fourth line center, Yuho Lamico Ma- and Matthew Highmore and Justin Bailey. Um, they will all become, unless they reach an agreement with the Canucks, uh, free agents on July the 13th. Uh, Di Pietro uh, still is a restricted free agent. The 23-year-old played one game with the Canucks, went 15, 13, and 4 in Abbotsford. Um, Lamico and Highmore were both, are both 26 years old. Uh, they were, you know, brought in by Jim Benning. They helped. They were part of a, you know, a decent fourth line in Vancouver. Uh, Highmore scored five goals and had 12 points in 46 games, while Lamico had seven goals for 15 points in 75 games. While uh, the aforementioned Bailey spent most of his time in Abbotsford. Uh, scoring 15 goals and 27 points in 30 games and played 14 games up in Vancouver. Lamico was a part of the Ole Ulevi trade. Um, and he, you know what, quite frankly, he's played very well. Uh, he was one of those fan favorite, you know, gritty, grindy guys. But um, again, I think the Canucks just wanted more sandpaper on that fourth line. Um, and they were looking for that. And they are continuing to reform this roster, reform this team. And one of the players I think that they might take a look at is uh, Evgeny Malkin, the uh, superstar, or well, yes, he still is a superstar. Uh, the superstar uh, from the Pittsburgh Penguins who will, uh, who was announced today that he will test uh, the open market. Uh, of course, Evgeny Malkin is a multiple times Stanley Cup winner, uh, Art Ross trophy winner, and for the first time in his career, a free agent. You know, he's 36 at the end of this month. He spent his entire 16-year uh, career in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, Rob Rossi, the athletic in Pittsburgh, said that negotiations with the Penguins are held up. They prefer to sign him to a three-year deal, uh, which would, you know, kind of pair him off with Crosby's in the last of his deals. However, apparently Malkin wants a longer time, a longer-term commitment. Um, he's a two-time Art Ross winner, he, but he's also – had a bit of injuries. You know, he's coming off two ACL surgeries. He's played um, only more than 70 games once in the last 10 years. Um, last year, he had 20 goals, 42 points in 41 games. So he's still, you know, hovering on a point per game. So is he something, buddy, the Canucks could take a look at? Um, of course, Patrick Alvin and Jim Rutherford have ties with Evgeny Malkin, winning Stanley Cups with him uh, in Pittsburgh. The Canucks have two young Russian players in Vasily Podkolzin and Andre Kuzmenko. And could Malkin center a line with those two? I don't know. But I would be intrigued to see what would happen because depending on the price of getting Malkin, if he goes to market and he had, well, he now is going to market, uh, he's going to get some lucrative offers. Um, he, a guy of his stature who, like I mentioned, you know, two-time scoring champ, three-time Stanley Cup winner, uh, a surefire hockey Hall of Famer. These guys don't hit the market that much. And yes, he's 36 and he's injury prone, but there will be people out there that will offer him a lot of money to come play for them. Now, I'm not saying the Canucks will do that because Jim Rutherford and Patrick Alvin are not stupid, but it is intriguing to Evgeny Malkin to come play and kind of how the roles have reversed. You know, always there's always those reports when you know he first came in the league, Sergei Gonchar uh, played a huge role in his development and getting him acclimated to uh, the North American lifestyle. Um, and you wonder, could that be a role he could fill in Vancouver and kind of you know, go from being, you know, that young, you know, upstart, high value Russian prospect turns into a superstar. And now he's the Wiley veteran. Could he come into Vancouver and help out these two talented young Russians Vancouver has in Andre Kuzmenko and Vasily Podkolzin? Because I'm almost certain those two would have looked up to Evgeny Malkin and he's a hero to them, uh, you know, being from Russia, 
winning multiple Stanley Cups, being one of the best players we have seen in a generation, he would command that respect, similar respect I was saying that Henrik and Daniel Sedin who have been warranting at prospect camp. So is that somebody that the Canucks could look at now? They don't have the space to sign him right now, but if the JT Miller shoe does drop as it will, as we all assume it does eventually, that frees up some space. So could Malkin be coming in on a, you know, a shorter term deal, maybe even be a one, two year deal um, to come play in Vancouver in what would have to be a top nine role. Now you got, then you would think with a center of Pedersen, Horvat, and Malkin. Well, where would you slide Bo Horvat? Does he play the third line role then? But he's going to need a new deal. And are you going to be paying your third line center, your captain, um, you know, five, you know, six plus seven plus million dollars, which what we expect Bo Horvat to get, I don't know. So, would work in vain because of the time Rutherford and Naveen and Kuzmenko uh, and Pod Coles. And I don't think of getting Malkin. Uh, quite, I think Malkin stays in Pittsburgh just for I don't, I can't see of getting Malkin playing uh, in another jersey other than a Pittsburgh Penguins, the black and gold. You know, him and Sidney Crosby, uh, it's well documented. They have a great relationship. They're best of friends. They've won cups together. Uh, they just signed Chris Letang. Ron Hextall last week said at the draft that they're going to try their damnness to get Malkin re-signed. Um, and he's a franchise icon. And whether he's old enough or not, um, he deserves to finish his career in Pittsburgh. He is a Pittsburgh Penguin. Um, and I think he will re-sign there. Um, but a dark, two dark horse teams, I think, for Malkin would be, um, first of all, would be the Florida Panthers, um, a team that, you know, is talented that won the President's Trophy that has, you know, Russian players there. Um, and they've always been a hotbed for Russian players. So I could see the Florida Panthers uh, or the Calgary Flames. Yes, the Calgary Flames, who uh, I think are going to lose Johnny Goudreau. I'm a huge proponent and a believer that Johnny Goudreau is going to leave um, Calgary and, you know, go. He's from, you know, the eastern coast, eastern seaboard of the United States. I think Johnny Goudreau goes to Philly uh, and plays for John Tortorella. He, you know, he just came under Daryl Sutter. And he, I think he can finally, um, you know, work his way back, uh, work his way back to where he's from and go towards John Tortorella and something in Philly, uh, which will leave a gaping hole for uh, the Calgary Flames. And I think that will force him to overpay for Evgeny Malkin and offer him said lucrative deal. So that's what I think is going to happen with Evgeny Malkin. Uh, a couple other free agent news that kind of happened today was, first of all, um, Gino Malkin, no, not Gino Malkin, Valerie Nechushka, another uh, Russian free agent or said to be free agent, re signed with Chicago. I mean, Chicago, the defending champs, Colorado, um, for an eight year, $6.125 million deal. Uh, big money for Nechushka, who probably would have got more on the open market, but the eight year term to me was absolutely astronomical. Now, he was an integral part to this team. Uh, that I wanted to just won the Stanley Cup. You know, he put up some big numbers in the playoffs, put some big goals, but he's coming off just a couple of years ago, struggling heavily in Dallas and not scoring a goal in the entire season to get a $6.12 million deal is very, very big. Um, so I'm interested to see how that pans out because for Bo, Bo Horvat and JT Miller, if they are to resign deals, you can look at that and be like, well, he just got $6.125 million and his impact is not to the level of what we're doing. So could that throw a wrench into the Canucks' plans to re-sign guys like Horvat, uh, most importantly, Bo Horvat, or even JT Miller? Because uh, reports are indicating that the Canucks are offering Miller 7.5 on a five- to six-year deal, right? So how does that all play in now? I don't know. Um, and then also, finally, the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, acquired Matt Murray uh, to be their new starting goalie, uh, which is tough. Because Matt Murray has got injury prone in Ottawa, you know, of course, you know, Rutherford and Alvin saw him firsthand in Pittsburgh uh, when he helped them win uh, two Stanley Cups back to back. Um, but I'm very intrigued to see uh, how the goaltending situation in Toronto is going to, you know, go forward with Matt Murray basically being your number one, unless you get a guy like Darcy Kemper, uh, who, quite frankly, you know, won a Stanley Cup with Colorado, but wasn't the reason uh, he struggled a bit in the playoffs. So again, the Leafs goaltending issues continue it's what happens when you're a top heavy team, uh, an important position like goaltending does struggle. 
Uh, and this, I feel, clears the door for Jack Campbell to probably sign uh, with Edmonton on a big deal that uh, I think will be an overpay. But again, it's Edmonton. You have to overpay for free agents. Um, and then, of course, Evander Kane. Uh, reports are saying that you know Edmonton offered him a four-year by $4.5 million deal. Um, and he's going to market, but you know that offer is still on the table. But also people are saying that he wants $7 million. Um, I've always been a proponent that Canucks should go after Evander Kane, uh, strictly sticking um, on ice. We know some of the stuff he's done off the ice has, has been inexcusable and all that. But if we're looking strictly on ice performance based, uh, Evander Kane can play on any team. He was a point per game player, racked up points. And you could say he played with McDavid and Drysada, but if you look at his numbers throughout his career, uh, he scores goals. And you can't have enough goal scorers on our team. But I think. The suitors, what it looks like is it's got Edmonton, Calgary, and Washington. Now, the Rangers are interested in Nazim Kadri. He's apparently is number one on their list. So does that mean JT Miller to Washington might be big because they don't have um, Nick Backstrom? So a lot of these dominoes are about to fall right now. And coming up after this final break, um, we're going to talk about a domino that didn't fall uh, in on the draft. And that was, of course, JT Miller to the... New York Islanders. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into JT Miller. Kind of tidbit it right there with the Rangers, but stick around for that. And welcome back to Locked On Canucks, the show that keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. Final block, let's go quickly. So, of course, JT Miller, you know, seems like he's going to get dealt eventually somewhere around the corner, you know, sooner rather than later, but maybe. Um, but on draft day on Thursday, it was, you know, very widely reported that the Canucks and the Islanders had a deal in place for said JT Miller. Uh, it looked like it was a done deal. Something was close, but then it fell through. Um, if you looked at after the draft, um, Patrick Alvin said there was nothing in the works with the Islanders. While GM Lula Morello said, uh, ask, talk to Vancouver. So there's all these, reports, all these indications of something going on with something there. I'm a firm believer of when there, where there was smoke, there's a fire. So I definitely think something happened. There might have been a deal in principle, um, but it probably fell through for some other reason. Now, when I was looking at the Islanders, it kind of they have one very uh, you know interesting prospect, Atu Ratti. You know, he came over um, and he played very well in the AHL last year, and I think the Canucks probably wanted that. And I don't know if they want to offer him it. And it also was the fact that. The Islanders wanted to acquire JT Miller to keep him away from teams like the Capitals, the Rangers, the Devils, uh, so they don't bolster their chances in their division. So I talked about it before. The reports are saying that you know Nazim Kadri uh, is number one on the Rangers bullet on the on the Rangers free agent list. Well, if Kadri goes to New York, that essentially takes them out of JT Miller's sweepstakes. So that only leaves really New Jersey, Washington. Maybe Carolina. Carolina has some free agents of their own, like Vincent Trocheck and Mito Niederreiter. Um, so, could the market be playing, you know, itself out? Now, I've said this last two episodes. I still think there's going to be a big market for JT Miller. Um, Patrick Alvin and Jim Rutherford are just doing their due diligence and waiting to do what's best for the hockey team. Now, if that means that JT Miller stays in Vancouver, yes, but. I overthinking about it on the weekend. I don't know if JT Miller can come back on this deal come September because we know the media here in Vancouver will be asking questions on a daily, daily basis. So JT Miller, what about your contract situation? What about this? How does this affect your contract situation? It'll just be weighing on the player and the team's shoulders all year. So a decision has to be made. Either A, a deal gets made where you trade him and it's, you know, you get whatever you get for him, or you re-sign him. I know I said before that you could trade him at the deadline and stuff like that, but I don't think that works. I think it would just be a huge weight, a huge cloud over this organization that, A, you don't want as a team, B, you're to go through that because that kind of, as much as people want to block it out and stuff, we have, um, it bothers them and it will affect them. So I don't want to see that. It has, there has to be resolution to this JT Miller um, situation within the next five weeks, whenever, or by, by the time September hits or training camp starts, there has to be 
um, something that takes place, whether it's a new deal or something. So that will be the biggest key to the Canucks offseason. Still, what happens with JT Miller and how does that affect other moves? I don't expect anything big to happen for Vancouver this week other than potentially a Bo Horvat extension um, or a Miller trade. Um, maybe some fringe free agent signings because they don't have a whole lot of space right now. So, you know, potential, you know, Pearson salary dumps, Dickinson salary dumps, whatever that could take place. But if those don't happen yet, it'll just be minor moves, filling out the Abbotsford roster. Um, the bigger moves this week, I do suspect or could suspect would be a Bo Horvat extension, maybe a JT Miller extension, maybe a JT Miller trade. But Whatever happens at Canucks line, you know us here at Locked On Canucks will keep you locked in and tuned you into all of that. So uh, I want to thank you for making Locked On Canucks your first listen of the day. Um, tomorrow, again, Prospect Development Camp will dive into that. Um, and we'll see if there's any other big news that drops. Now, I want you to make your second listen Locked On NHL. It covers the playoffs like no other. Hear the latest news and opinions from local experts every Monday through Friday. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast services. Guys, take care. 